incredible morning for me already. Got here early, spent some time with Pastor. Like you said, we went to college a couple of years together, and but uh, you know, just catching up and praying. Uh, he gave a word to me this morning that uh, I'm holding on to, and uh, that's before I ever came and did worship, right? I mean, this is my first in-person service since February. Uh, where I live uh, in Nevada right now, uh, th this is the first Sunday they're allowed to be open to have services. So my family's going back to church at the church we attend in person. We were on the couch every week uh, participating, but it's just something about being all in the room together and and uh, just wonderful. I grew up in a church very similar to this. My dad is a pastor, and uh, you know, it used to our our parsonage where we lived would was right off the back over there, though, right? You could walk right from the church into the house, and so about noontime every Sunday, you know, people get fidgety because my mom would have that crock pot going, you know, and you'd <laughs> smell all that food, and uh, you'd want to go, but. It looked very similar to this, and uh, only we had a baptismal tank back here too. And and uh, one time uh, I was tasked with shutting off that baptismal tank, and um, that was probably a task my father should not have given me. Right? And I was out playing with my brother, and we were playing football Sunday afternoon. It was a Sunday evening service, and uh, got tired, went and took a nap, and I woke up dead out of my nap, sat straight up. And uh, sure enough, I forgot to turn it off. So I went running in, and I saw the water was coming over the top, but not very bad. It didn't, it wasn't, it didn't look too bad, right? Yeah. So, so I went down into the basement to uh, turn that water off. And uh, when I hit that third step from the bottom, I went knee deep right into water in the whole basement of the church. <laughs> so um, maybe I'm not built for in-person services, you know, in church. No. But uh, yeah, just sitting back here worshiping and praying and looking around the room and uh, very familiar to me, and I, I thank you guys for letting me be part of your Sunday service. It's, uh, it's great to get back out and worship uh, with people. It's my homeland, right? Last night I stayed in uh, Devil's Lake. I grew up going to the Bible college right there at Lake... Uh, um, Thank you. I, I got Devil's Lake in my head and I couldn't shake it, but uh, grew up there. Um, Fent, uh, felt an original call to ministry at those altars, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's been a good day just in the area driving around, and, and uh, you know, I'm excited. I've been waiting for my wife uh, to, to text me, you know, just to say everything's going good at home, and, and uh, but there's no cell phone service out here. It's like, a, it's really like heaven to tell the truth, other than that one thing. It's kind of awesome. But it's been great. Uh, I am excited today to kind of give you a little, uh, little bit of input, a uh, little lay of the land with uh, ministry, a missions organization my wife and I started back in 2007 called Free International. And free is our, our acronym. Free stands for find, restore, embrace, and empower. And uh, we've been working with uh, issues of human trafficking, and that level of exploitation really since 2003 and 2004 when we went to India to work with an organization called Project Rescue, another missions organization. And uh, it's just been interesting to see the journey God takes you on. Um, I am doing, uh, well, at least the type of people I'm working with were not even on my radar back when we were going to college. I did not have a course in how to do this, right? Nothing. But I did have an incredible heritage, you know, that, and again, growing up where I've grown up, a uh, real understanding of what it means to be present in people's lives, right? Uh, and I remember growing up as a kid, my grandmother is a, was a church planter. She planted 13 churches during the Great Depression into World War II. And uh, we used to always pick her brain, right? Uh, on those days when they would travel around, they, uh, her and her two sisters, had this big tent and they would go into areas where there was no church and they would set up tent meetings for six months, nine months, a year until a, a church would be birthed out of that. And then out of that, you know, out of that church, a, a full-time pastor would be brought in. They'd move on and plant another church, right? Just amazing. All those churches still exist to this day. In fact, I've had uh, the privilege 
of being able to preach in a couple of them. And, and it's just amazing. I remember uh, there was one in Montana in particular. I was sitting there. They had a potluck afterwards. And we're sitting around the table. And this one guy's just boring a hole into my head. I see him just staring at me, like gla- not glaring, but just staring at me. And so I began to uh, engage with him a little bit. And he just was so smitten because when uh, he was a teenager, it was my grandmother's uh, um, church services that he came to where he come to know the Lord for the first time and became part of this church and, a, and had been part of this church for a, a couple generations. And so, so to see her grandchild there in front of him uh, was pretty significant. And it was significant to me, you know, to know that history, the fam, you know, I, I'm a product of the people who have raised me, right? I'm mostly a product of God who redeemed me and transformed my life. But I had nothing but great uh, experience from a very early age with my God and with the people I, I worshiped with each and every week. It formed me. It made me who I was. But I used to pick my grandmother's brain on those different things. And, and one of the things she always used to say, you know, pulling, pulling stories out of her was tough, almost like a veteran who'd come back from war. You know, she just, uh, she, she loved what God had done, but she was never one who would look always to the past as the good old days. But what did God have for her each and every day and in pouring into people's life? So, so she was hesitant to tell old stories without, you know, that context in mind. And but she said, you know, Mike, people love to be prayed for. It does not matter their background. It does not matter if they believe in a God or they're atheists. When people's backs are against the wall, when there's struggles in their life, they, lo- they like to know that you care enough about them to carry uh, their need to your God. And she said, beyond that, what's better than that even is our God is real and he answers prayer. So we see God show up in amazing ways, and that in many ways was the origin story. That, that whole um, uh, time I spent with my grandma where she was explaining that, to, that got me where we are today. <laughs> we were, uh, my wife and I were campus pastors at Purdue University, and uh, at the time, uh, my wife also worked for Purdue, a huge university, about 45,000 students, And she ran the International Center there, which was kind of the cultural hub of all the different students from around the world. And we had a lot of them. There was, uh, I think we had the second most uh, international students uh, in the country on our campus. 142 countries were represented on our campus. And so on top of that, she would do all the orientation. So when these students would come from around the world to go to college, uh, in university and graduate school and everything, uh, the first person they would usually meet is, is my wife, right? It was a very, very great place to do ministry as we interacted with these people from around the world. So we were setting up for an event one day. In, uh, it was January of 1995. We were setting up for an event. There was going to be a thousand interna- new international students coming in, and we were going to do this orientation. And uh, about, about two hours before the event was to take place, we're setting up and in walks an African student. And the African student, uh, I saw him come in. I'm like, oh, he, he's early. He must not know what time it is. I, you know, I've, I've worked with many African uh, people and students and, and uh, you know, over the course of, of the ministry we had done. And uh, one thing I knew is they were, the African students were never early for anything, right? <laughs> they, were, they were always... Uh, always late. Uh, they'd always stay the longest, right? They had the most time to give, but the, you know, time starting eluded them very much. And so, so I went up to him thinking maybe he was in the wrong place or didn't know the right time. And no, he had come uh, early because he was hoping to meet someone. He'd been in the country for two weeks and he hadn't met anyone yet. And, um, and he was really lonely, as you can imagine. But beyond being lonely, uh, he, had to, he, he came from a very tough country in Africa. And, uh, and he didn't come, uh, he didn't have any status or anything, but he was brilliant. So his country sent him to college. The country was going to pay for it. Uh, but in the past, when they had done that, they had problems because those who they sent off to college who didn't come from status with their family, because you, you you know, he's going to try to do a master's and a PhD in a second language in a foreign land. That's a, that's tough 
that's tough, right? And so, uh, so they usually sent families as a support base, but they were finding every time they did that, those families would go, thank you very much, and then not come back, right? So incentivize the return uh, of this brilliant man, uh, they, they sent him alone. He had been married for one year, and he had a two-week-old daughter, and he wasn't going to see him for three years. Yeah, exactly, right? And so he's telling me this story, and he had come early because he was hoping to you know, find, find a friend, right? And so that moment when my grandmother was telling me about people loving to be prayed for just was right at the front of my brain. So I, I, offered, I offered to pray for him. Uh, not at the event, right? We step aside away from, uh, from the university activities, and he said, absolutely. And so I said a prayer for him. I don't even remember what I said, but when I opened my eyes, that was the brightest smile I'd ever seen in my life, right? I was his new best friend. And so he began to tell me, about some of his desires and his hopes as he went back to his country when he went back, because he had ideas. If, if he was going to be put in a position of authority, he wanted to be able to you know, do some good for his country, because again, it was a tough country. In fact, he, was, he began to tell me uh, about his nephews who had been sold into these labor camps, and his nieces as young as eight years old who had been sold into the brothels of that country. And I remember hearing this, and it was, it was kind of like, you know, you know those, uh, there are always those moments that sear a spot in your brain, you know, usually it's like things like 9-11 or different things like that where you just, you can't believe what you're hearing or seeing, and it just, everything about that room. I could get a sketch artist here from the FBI, and I could probably get close to, you know, even all these years later, what that room looked like, because it just seared a spot in my brain. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And that really began, you know, our journey without realizing it to do the ministry we we're doing today, right? Uh, we began to educate ourselves as much as we could on this, very little we could find. You know, the internet was even relatively new, so it was hard to dig around and find stuff. But God continued to just keep this on our heart. And uh, we... We were asked to, uh, strangely enough, um, come out to New York City after our time in, in, uh, at Purdue, and we were supposed to plant 20 churches in New York City. And, you know, that's a story for another day. But the first week we were in New York City, uh, first couple weeks we were in New York City, the, the church we were pastoring at was right next to Madison Square Garden, right across the street from Penn Station and all that. So, in New York City, you always had to keep doors and everything locked, right? And, you know, greet people at the door. And, and uh, so all of a sudden we get a buzz on the door. We walk, uh, my wife and I walk to the door to let uh, whoever's buzzing the door in. And there stands a man, uh, uh, two men. Their names were Peter and Paul. <laughs> I kid you not. And uh, they were brothers and they were from London. And uh, they, were, they, were, uh, they were ministers. And uh, one of the things that they had done, and they, there's no official thing called a chaplain at the UN, but that's something that they somehow tied themselves into where when the UN was meeting all the leaders of the world, they would come as ministers of the gospel and interact with all the leaders of these countries. So while they were meeting, uh, while they were in meetings, this uh, Peter and Paul would fast and they would pray uh, about what they, you know, their interactions uh, all day long. Um, they would sleep at the church all day long. They would fast and pray until whatever lunch break or whatever it was when these leaders of the world would come out. And then they would be there to interact with them. And this time they had come because God had placed on their heart um, that they should be interacting with the leaders of the world in these matters of human trafficking, right? And so we're standing there, it's like all along the way, God continues to put, you know, continue to put people in my wife and I's journey um, to the point where we had to do something about it, right? I mean, we had dug and dug and read and prayed a lot, and prayer is work, and reading is work. But as somebody who grew up uh, with ranchers and farmers and everything else, there come a time where all this knowledge in our head, we wanted to put to work you know, put the work boots on and go after it. And so that's where God led us to that point where we just finally said, all right, God, we're in, right? 
And uh, so it was in that process we ended up uh, saying yes, became world missionaries, and went to India uh, to work with matters of human trafficking in India. India has got big problems with trafficking, um, probably more than any other country in the world as far as the numbers of those who are trafficked in India. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, the uh, theology and the structure of that country. They have a caste system there and all these different things that, that um, add to those problems. Other countries, I know you said this morning you guys had been missionaries for a season in, in the Philippines and, and all these different countries where we knew there was work that needed to be done. And so we dove in head first, got involved with Project Rescue in India, worked with them for four years. And uh, we loved India, and, and my wife and I love serving wherever we're at, and we, we have an inclination to be able to kind of uh, dig in wherever we've lived. Uh, we had no ambition to ever live in New York City and minister in New York City, and yet God led us there, right? In fact, when we were there, it was always funny, you guys will, will all appreciate this, the, the people of New York City uh, would say it's, it, 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 it's hard to gain trusting relationships in the city if you're an outsider, unless you're from the Midwest, because it, 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 there's just, the, we're, we're real, right? We're authentic. What you see is what you get. And in a city where everybody's working angles on you, to have somebody who's not working an angle on you is a big deal, right? And so they embraced us quickly, and we we're able to, to, to really do a lot of great things in New York City, even when we came back to start Free International. God was stirring us, and we didn't know what that meant. We, we knew we weren't going to stay in India, even though we adored, and I still got clothes in a closet in an apartment in India because I thought at some point we would be back there as missionaries. And yet God, when we said yes to him, he opened up other doors. We were like, where is it? Where is it that God really has for us? And, and brought us right back to the States, right? Because every time we would come back and tell those stories about what God was doing in India and in the brothels and the big red light districts of India, there was, there was places in Bombay that we were working where there was over 100,000 girls in one location, most of them under 18 years old that we were working with. Our heart was really there. In fact, that's where God solidified our calling to this forever. We already thought we were forever. We really knew it was forever then, right? We, uh, we went one night into this one red light district uh, with some nationals we were working with. We were in this car. My son at the time was only three, curly blonde hair, blue eyes. We start driving. During the day, this, this, it's kind of like an alleyway. It really wasn't any wider than the church, uh, the whole place. And it, during the day, it was uh, legitimate businesses. And at night, it, these would all turn into brothels, right? And these girls would be out on the street, and it was raining the night we were driving through. And there was, uh, it, it was, uh, I don't know, a uh, half mile long and about 14,000 girls in this one area. And when we were driving through, everyone was so close to the cars, they had their umbrellas that they literally had to lift their umbrellas up so you could drive and not hit their umbrella. And so my son was in the front seat, uh, you know, flipping and flopping and kicking the driver in the head and all that fun stuff. And and I remember, you know, uh, we, we have this saying, right? The eyes are the window to the soul. I haven't even told this story in years, you know, where God did this in our life. But, but I remember as we were driving through uh, this red light district and these thousands of girls were there, uh, they would look in the car and they would see, they would see my son, right? And, and he was a sight, right? Yeah, I'm pale, white, blonde kid with blue eyes, you know, in the heart of India, kind of sticks out, right? And, uh, and so they'd look in and they'd see my son and you'd see the hugest smile come on their face. And the f first girl that saw her son would turn and I don't, I don't know what language she was speaking. These girls were from all over uh, Southern Asia, uh, but she would holler down the road, and as we drove very slowly, very slowly through this, you know, because they're all right on the street with their umbrellas, all these girls just started looking in the car to see my son, all of them, all of them. And they were walking from the building to peek in because they just kept yelling down the street about my uh, son. And they were they would smile and they had just life in their eyes. And then they'd turn back around and see me in the back seat um, or the car behind us, you know, that they had to then wave down. 
and you would just see all that disappear, right? That was probably 20 minutes of that, and we were done, right? I mean, we got to the end of that. My, my wife and I can be chatty. You know, we're sociable and chatty people. It was almost two hours before either of us could say a word. God just really put the heaviness of that on our heart. And that's when we went, all right, <laughs> we were in, now we're really in, right? But we didn't know what that meant. And so we saw God, we'd come back and speak about all these things across the United States. And everybody's like, oh man, we've raised money for a home in India or Thailand or whatever. We love being able to do that. But what can we do? What can we put our hands to? What can we do here? And so, uh, so we just began to think that was the voice of God telling us, all right, maybe we're thinking this beyond our own borders as a world missions thing, but maybe we really need to find a way to connect our churches and our people into real work here in the United States. But we didn't know if uh, the Assemblies of God, which is the denomination we're part of, was ready for it yet. So I called, um, called a guy I knew, we were friendly. I wouldn't know if we'd call us friends, but we interacted over the years. His name's Hal Donaldson. Uh, he started Convoy of Hope, which you might've heard. And when he started Convoy of Hope, it was just his pickup truck and a bunch of groceries in the back meant to serve those who were struggling poverty in rural America. And then disasters were happening and they would respond and they were doing such a good job responding that that thing just blew up. But when he started, he, he, you know, uh, the denomination he was also a part of was like, that sounds awesome. You know, let us, let us know how it goes. <laughs> you know, they just, you know, they weren't going to put their arms around it yet yeah. until it got really big and successful and everything else. And then we were quick to throw our arms around. I don't mean that to sound cynical. It was just the process that I went, well, if that's his story, I think that might be something we'd have to do. I just got to figure out how to feed my family because I knew we were going to do this, you know, whether we were missionaries that, you know, that uh, were approved missionaries or whatever, it was going to have to happen. And so he goes, no, 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 I think the timing's right for this. Uh, you know, you're, you're not going to have to do that. So, um, so I went in and I presented this concept of free international. And within 24 hours, and it was in a room full of all these people. It was the weirdest thing because they had all these mucky mucks from world missions, the regional directors, and all these you know, mucky mucks from U.S. missions, and three hours they grilled us. I'm like, well, this is an intriguing thing. <laughs> like, you know, I, I, I couldn't figure out why they had all these people who ran all these huge regions as part of this meeting. Well, lo and behold, going to the timing of all this, Pastor, we were talking about this morning, uh, it had been a few months that people, they were getting the same calls I was hearing in these churches, so the timing of our proposal that I gave to them seemed odd to them even, like maybe I had inside information that I was using, you know, like somebody was telling me, hey, put your, put your name in now because here's what's going on. And I had no clue at all. God had just lined up the timing of my wife and I's heart with the de desire of a people in our churches to reach the vulnerable and the exploited here in the United States. And, and we got approval to start Free International in that process. The journey started with an African student telling us how he wanted to make an impact in his country. And, and for whatever reason, God brought it all back home to us where we began to work here in the U.S. and things have been going bonkers, uh, especially for the last five to ten years as God's people have made a huge impact. Like I told you, Free International stands for this. It stands for find, restore, embrace, and empower. You know, the first thing we wanted to be able to do is identify those who are being exploited. In India, you could go into a red light district of 100,000 girls. It's right there. You know, it's, you still got to figure out how to help and how to, how to get people out of that situation. But here in this country, even though it's a huge thing, we have a tendency to look past it because we have a hard time thinking you know, what actually we're hearing is going on now is actually going on, right? It's a struggle for us to wrap our brain around. One of the things I always loved, um, not just about where I grew up and the heritage I have, but this, this thing of human trafficking is relatively new, con not concept, but a relatively new term. It really is just modern day slavery is what it is. Um, and, and it doesn't just have to deal with, with those who are, who are tied 
uh, to prostitution or in those areas. It, it can include a whole lot of things. But, but I, I remember, uh, it's been about five years ago now that a friend of mine who's a historian gave me a book. And the book he gave me was How to Prevent the Traffic in Young Girls. And uh, I opened the book up, and in the front page of the book, the copyright date of this book was 1899, less than 40 years after the Emancipation Proclamation. And the book was based on a conference that was held on human trafficking in the mid-1890s. Kind of blew my mind, right? Because it's a new term that I'm hearing, but the reality has always been God always has a remnant of people he's working through throughout history. You, you, you might not know their name. You, not, you might not know that. And that's kind of where we rooted ourselves, not only in just the local church, which we believe philosophically is God's chosen agency to reach this world, but we rooted ourselves in the concept that this is no novelty. Men uh, and people and women throughout history have been exploited. There have been those who are like you know, the enemy is like a roaring lion seeking whom he can destroy and devour, right? But the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So our first concept with Free International went there. It's like we need to be able to find those who are being exploited. We need to find ways that our churches can have conversations in some ways that they've never had before. One in three girls, one in three boys now, or one in five boys before they hit 18 will have been abused in the family somehow, right? These are people who are sitting in many of our churches all over, and sometimes it's easier to think we got to go to India to save the slaves than it is to address real hurt and vulnerability in our own population, right? I think the more we get into rural America, the, the, the easier that can be, and sometimes it's harder. I know my wife and I, a few years back, were at a church in New Jersey. And uh, as we were at, uh, done with the service, and this happens frequently, but this one uh, struck us hard. There was an 88-year-old woman on a walker who was weeping in front of us telling her story of her own abuse from the time from 8 to 18 years old almost nightly her father abused her uh, when she left at 18 she didn't look back right she didn't look back she was part of this church for all these years uh, she was in no way in a situation where she was going to be trafficked or exploited i'm not drawing that connection that a connection I am drawing is she spent 70 years sitting on this story. This was the first time in 70 years she was able to unburden herself with what her history had been for all those years. And I think the timing is, is now in the hurt of this world and, and healthy churches and healthy families create place for, for those things to be addressed, right? I mean, uh, I'm in a lot of ethnic churches. Some of our ethnic churches that I get to go speak in, some of those things are happening so frequently, but it's, you never talk about it. And since you never talk about it, uh, those who are being exploited continue to sit in their pain each and every night. And, and the church is meant to be a place of healing, right? A place of hope, a place of reconciliation, a place where we meet our God love our God, and love each other as he loved us. And if we're not involved with each other's lives, we can't get there, can we? If you can't trust the burden of some of these stories with the people you trust most, you know, it just eat away at you. We should not have 88-year-old women on walkers telling their story for the first time in any of our churches. And I don't say that as a problem in this church. I'm just saying, I think God's God's doing something in our churches where, where some of these hard issues are getting talked about because some, it, it's easier sometimes to talk about uh, the traffic victims, but we're, we're seeing back in our churches, you know, we can't talk past the hurt of the people who are closest to us in an attempt to just talk about those who need help somewhere else. I live in Las Vegas right now. When I talk about Las Vegas, people go, oh yeah, of course, right? <laughs> of course. But I, I, I passed my share of strip clubs driving out here from Minot through Devil's Lake to here right on the main road, right? Um, 
There are connections to these things going on right at the foot of all of our churches. But God is raising up a people. And that, that's why we got approved as U.S. missionaries to address this here. But identifying the need is so important. We need to find those who are being exploited. When we first uh, started doing free here in the States, we started doing these outreaches at the Super Bowl. Uh, it helped us learn what this looked like because there was a lot of exploitation happening in the city where the Super Bowl would come in because there's just so much money coming into that economy that those uh, uh, pimps, right? We, this PG message, I'm not going to dig into anything, but there's certain terms I have to use, uh, see that entrepreneurially as an opportunity for them. At the same time, we began to identify that those kids who were missing that we see the posters of were, were oftentimes being exploited in the very ways, you know, I'm insinuating this morning going on. And so, uh, so we would rally around and we would do this thing uh, we now call the big search, where we would identify a top 30 list of missing kids in the area, and then we would work with law enforcement and mobilize the church to be active to find the real face that's missing and needs to be found. And on the other side, do significant outreach to those who are being exploited uh, and, and many times being trafficked. So we went into Miami for the first Super Bowl we did and we were working with Miami Vice and we brought in, uh, it was about 80 people, almost all of them from our churches in that area there, some college and career groups, some, some uh, moms with children were helping. And over three days, uh, and Miami Vice gave us their list of their, their missing kids that have been gone for at least six months. And they were having a hard time finding them and they were likely being exploited. And over 72 hours, we cleared three precincts worth of missing kids off the books and seven traffic victims were recovered in three days time. How awesome is that, right? Because God's church was willing to seek those who needed help. Go, how'd you do that? Just this last big search we did in Las Vegas, we found 24 kids in 72 hours and 11 traffic victims were helped, right? You go, man, how is that possible? Well, we were looking for them, right? You can't find what you're looking, not looking for, right? And, and God's people being mobilized has done huge things. Over the last few years, I've had the chance twice to present to the, all the attorneys general of the United States of America, because they're like, oh man, the church is kind of a cool place. How do we tap into that? You know, how do we mobilize the faith community? I'm like, they're already ready to be, they're already, right? So how does that look? And that's where free is kind of um, gained some momentum is recognizing the church in every neighborhood has an impact with those closest to them, right? And then be able to go, okay, what does this look like? And not only that, how do we seek those out who need help? Find those who are being exploited. As part of that process, do you guys know what Speed the Light is? No? Speed the Light is uh, like 75 years ago, uh, these youth groups and churches just like this were wanting to help with missions but they, they wanted to kind of focus on something. So they started focusing on providing vehicles, transportation for missionaries when they'd land in the countries they were going to. Because like if you're going to fly into, you know, especially back then, it's not like you can go, you know, give 10% down and then pay monthly payments. You got to pay for those vehicles all at one time and, you know, in India or anywhere else. And so the, the kids began to go, okay, we'll take care of that. So when you're a missionary, when you land in your country, we'll do all the fundraising needed so that you have a vehicle. So when you land, you can speed the light to all the places that need the, the gospel, right? So over the last few years, they started to do some major projects, right? Take on a bigger thing, and then all the states would help with that. And they, they asked us if we'd be willing to be their major project. And so, um, so they raised half a million dollars worth of money. We didn't get the money, we got the equipment for two mobile command centers. And the idea behind the mobile command centers for us was it allowed us to create space where we could be in neighborhoods that are, be very present in people's time of need. We're providing uh, legal help and medical help and, and different things that those who are being exploited very much need help with. Tattoo removal and cover-ups. Oftentimes, pimps will, will brand the girls in an ownership thing, right? So when we get those girls out of their situation, 
the faster we can get that mark off them, the better. Because they're not owned by this guy, right? right? Wow. At all. Uh, they're created in the image of God to declare his glory to this world. And that's the message we get to bring. And so that, that allows us to create this space and a vehicle where we're working with other great faith-based groups and the churches to be able to provide real help to those being exploited. Um, I know Pastor's been on our Facebook page and been following things for a while. We were the only organization in Las Vegas that they allowed to park right on the Las Vegas Strip. And when uh, Vice and Metro does all their sweeps and, and picks up the girls, uh, they bring them right to our, our rig. It's a sight to see. There's like you know, paddy wagons everywhere and law enforcement and our Speed the Light mobile unit parked in front of the Bellagio Fountains ministering to girls all night long. Last one we did, 48 girls we were able to uh, interact with and help. Now, oftentimes that makes it hard because, you know, they don't necessarily want to be with us. They didn't choose to be in that moment. But when COVID hit, one of the benefits was some of the girls we offered help to two years ago and had no time for us were calling us. Two and three and four a day were going, hey, is there still help available? That of course there's help available, right? And we were able to take that find piece and be able to really build in relationship. And now we're helping these girls each and every day. Where once, you know, it's like spreading the gospel. You're casting that seed. But it's going to grow in the time that growth is needed. And COVID, as much as I loathe COVID, has made us busier, right? Uh, because the need is so heavy right now among those who are already being exploited. We need to find those who are being exploited, but we need to see them restored as well, right? The psalmist said this, he brought us out of the miry clay, but he also set our feet on a rock to stay. We could find a million traffic victims, and we're, gonna, we're working at it, but if we don't have that other side of this in place and a, and, and a path to wholeness, and, and we've done nothing for them. And ultimately, even if we've, you know, put all that in place, what does it profit somebody if they gain the whole world and lose their soul? It's important for us to be present in people's time of need. But it's also important that we're willing to invest in their lives for the long haul to see them restored. It's difficult. Last year, one of the girls we found during the big search, she was 17 years old, six months away from her 18th birthday. And, and what happens when you turn 18? You're an adult. And that changes a lot of things in how help can be accessed by somebody who's 18 uh, because now people assume you're making choices to do what you're doing, right? And so uh, her name was Helen. We got Helen out of her situation. And, um, uh, but Helen, uh, we were working with her social worker uh, uh, for this whole time. Helen's a uh, casework. She was a ward of the state, was about that thick. Her first week of life, her mom tried to sell her at a laundromat, right? And her whole life, every week, every month for her whole life was full of abuse and trauma and you name it. So it's really hard sometimes and still for me to wrap my brain around how do you help somebody like Helen? because you could wave the healthiest life in front of her six inches from her nose, she would not be able to recognize that. Honestly, this is where we really need your consistent prayers, right? How can somebody see what they've never seen before, right? And you know, I, I, uh, I worked heavily with Teen Challenge. We work heavily with Teen Challenge uh, a lot. I love Teen Challenge. Um, uh, if it weren't for Teen Challenge, a ministry like Free International probably wouldn't be able to exist because back when Teen Challenge started, the church rejected that approach because they saw it as social work, not, not ministry. But then there was these transformative situations, these, these people who were just severely drug addicted, radically healed at an altar and, and transformed, and, and the church went, well, that can't be bad. <laughs> this is legit. And so through the years, we keep hearing those stories. And, 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 and yet, when you have the high level of trauma we have, one thing I've learned is not only does it take longer than that to see these girls restored, 
But oftentimes what I've seen is I think God is using these girls to transform me, to transform the church, for us to recognize what it truly means to love when that process isn't as fast as we'd hope it'd be, or when that love is not returned to us like we think it should be, right? Uh, somebody like Helen is going to be a light, unless God completely miraculously heals her, which he can, and I'm praying for, and we're hoping for. But in that process, I got to realize God's trying to change me as much as he's trying to use me to change somebody else's life. I heard, um, I heard something said recently uh, that just stuck with me. It's an old quote that says, hey, everybody wants to change the world. Oftentimes, we fail to realize that in the process, God wants to change us as well. And that's where I see that the church, you know, things of COVID, all this stuff, all of it, I can't stand. We live in this fallen world and it's a struggle. But as we lay our lives down to serve those who most need it, God uses that to strengthen us as well. He uses that to strengthen his church. I've been in some, um, some conversations lately in this world. There's, all the, uh, there's not a word on the planet that can't be politicized in 10 seconds or less anymore, right? And so there's this uh, thing going on now about, about privilege, right? Uh, it's usually tied to race, but this idea of privilege. And, and it's just stuck with me. God kind of stuck this thing in my head because my instinct is to reject that that idea that I have any privilege. I, you know, I grew up lower class, you know, not, not a lot of wealth, all this stuff. Uh, I had no privilege. But that's not the argument I think God, at least in my life, has for me. He, he lo I looked at the, the message of Jesus washing the disciples' feet, and Jesus said to me, almost clear as I heard his voice, said, this is what my son did with his privilege. And it wrecked me. Right? If you look at John 13, where the washing of the feet happens, the setup for that passage is this. It says that Jesus knew, he recognized, he understood, he had all authority and all power. That he had come from God and that he was going to return to God. So he grabbed a towel and a basin and he washed feet. So the recognition is of a people of faith, of me uh, in my own life was, oh, I'm not going to reject privilege. In fact, I have all privilege because that same spirit now dwells with us in his church. We have all authority and all power. And yet we see Jesus. What did he do with it? And I think it was way more than just a nice illustration, Right. Here, let me, let me do an illustrated sermon on the importance of humility. No, Jesus came to this world not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. He left us here, his church, to carry on that dynamic, right? We are saved by grace. We are brought out of darkness into light so that we can be light to this world. We have ladies on our team across the country who do work into the strip clubs and the brothels trying to reach the ladies at their place of employment. There's, there's a lot of dark places in this world of all types. That's a tough place to do ministry. In Nevada, we have legal brothels, right? When we bring missions teams out, uh, the ladies um, get to go out and serving the brothels with, with uh, some of uh, the girls that do ministry with us that way. It's a tough place to do work. And, uh, and yet, uh, God wants us to be light in the darkest places. Now, I'm not going to be in that strip club. When pastor comes out, I'm not bringing him to the strip club, right? I promise. <laughs> he wouldn't go even if I offered it to him, right? But but the reality of it all is that's who we are as a people of God. We need to find those who are being exploited, need to be in those dark places. But we need to see their lives restored and set on a firm foundation as well. 
we, um, we've had a few opportunities recently to see how God is really just, uh, he goes before us, right? Um, we, we now are part of a thing, we help launch a thing called Strikeout Slavery. So we, we work with Major League Baseball to be in the ballparks all across the country um, to educate on what this is and to identify vulnerability in that city. And beyond that, they want our big search, which is our ministry outreach that started as a Super Bowl outreach. We now have 12 cities lined up once COVID lifts. We had to postpone three of them already to go into cities and mobilize our churches and work with our law enforcement and our educators to reach those who so desperately need help. It's the very thing, that's the reason we were brought in front of all the attorneys general, and now every city that has a major league ballpark is going to be doing a big search with the church at front and center of reaching the vulnerable in those cities. How awesome is that? Right? Only God can do that. We, um, we have a school assembly program. It's called Say Something School Assembly. Uh, it just passed half a million students we've been in front of. Last year alone, before COVID shut down the schools, we had 19 young ladies that were being exploited that were identified, and now there are federal cases helping them uh, out of their situation. But in every city we've done these uh, school assemblies, we've worked closely with the churches to offer support to those families and help to those young ladies as they heal from their exploitation. We go in and we expose this lie to all those around uh, so hopefully many of them see the lie before it's ever told to them and something happens to them. But beyond that, it allows all, you know, the only thing that can happen from our silence is those exploiters continue to get to do what they want to do, right? The only thing that happens when we know somebody close to us is being abused, whether they're trafficked or not, is our silence only continues that exploitation. And 88-year-old women on walkers are weeping eight, 70 years after this happened because, because we just can't wrap our brain around the fact this is happening. And sometimes we can't wrap our brain around the fact that this is being done by somebody we know and care for, right? But we need to speak up, right? Beyond speaking up, we need to be present in people's time of need because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The pain, the sickness, the hurt. You know, until Christ comes again and takes us away, we're going to have to deal with that on this earth. God is the healing for that. But he uses his church to apply that healing into this world. We have been called out of darkness into light so that we might be light to this world. I'm just proud of what God is doing through Free International. And I believe that all the success we've seen is because we've honored the church as God's agency to reach this world, small and great alike. Whether it's on a tractor in a field, if it's in a high rise with a CEO, or a 18 year old girl in a legal brothel of Nevada, God wishes none should perish. And he has planted all of us where we are at so that we can be life. To a dying world. That gets me up every day and excites me, right? I, I, uh, I came in today and I was praying this morning with pastor and you know, I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to say today. I, I usually have thoughts and ideas today. I was just like, you know, this feels so much like home. I didn't know how I wanted to even present today, right? Uh, last year I was actually at home uh, in the church I grew up in, the Williston Assemblies of God, my dad pastor there, your sister was at that service, right? Small world here in North Dakota. Uh, tonight I get to speak, uh, what town am I in? Glenfield. Glenfield and Trinity Bible College students are all coming up to be a part of that. They're all going to come down this spring to work with us in Las Vegas. I say that to you because I, I, I ask your prayers. I mean, we don't have to be full-time mis missionaries to do the work I'm talking about today. We just have to be available, right? We have to be willing to see maybe what, that which eluded us in the past. And I say that without any cynicism, right? This is not a browbeat session for this church. It's me just speaking even daily into my own life 
because as long as I've done this and now I'm pushing 18 years full time doing work with people, when I went to college, like I told you, Bible college, this was not on my radar. You know, uh, the truck stops, the trucking routes, I would hear rumors, but I never could connect what I'm talking to you about right now with my place or the church's place and doing something about it. It just seems so disconnected. And yet God has transformed me, that whole concept of, of him. Leaving the privilege and glory of heaven so that we might experience what it is to be co-heirs with Jesus in that same privilege, but with that same tasking and mission. He didn't come to ser be served, but to serve. We no longer live our lives for ourselves, but for him. And that's really what love is, right? When we talk about love, love is self-giving, which is, an, is kind of ironic, right? So, so if God created us in his image and, 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 and through sending his son and taking away our sins and, and leaving his spirit with us, we have this relationship with him, right? We become more like he intended us to be in the original uh, condition as we continue to follow him, right? That discipleship. That, that's setting our feet on a firm foundation. So for truly us to be living the life God always intended from the beginning of time, we literally have to die to ourselves so that we might serve those who are around us each and every day, even the ones who have no time for us. You know, oftentimes people think uh, the work we do is like the movies, right? And we do some things, right? I remember, you guys ever hear um, that movie, Taken? You ever hear that movie, Taken? When that first came out, I got about 30, 40 texts going, is that what you do, right? I'm like, no, that's not the skill set I possess, right? <laughs> Yet. No. No, so they, they, you know, just contextually, you know, uh, how we view that. But but also the ending of that movie, you know, it's his daughter, but, you know, the fact that, oh, you rescued you, you saved me, you know, throw their arms around you and weep. Oh, we've been waiting for you. That almost never happens, right? Uh, what the enemy has done to totally destroy lives before we ever get to them is just a sight to be seen. The only way that can change is through a life, a long commitment to investing in their lives, to putting them in situations. Ultimately, we want to see them in power, on their own two feet, in churches like this, that are willing to continue to love on them as God grows their lives. That's what we want. And that's what God is doing through not just Free International, but through our partnerships with churches like yours. We, we it, it, just in closing, we have... Um, that, that company that gave us those two mobile command centers, and they're pretty cool. If you come to Vegas, I'll show you the one in Vegas. 48 foot, uh, the one is, you know, everything's whiteboard. All the stuff goes into the walls. If we're using it to provide services, we can. If we're using it for, um, like, uh, outreach, we have some technical stuff goes on. We have some people who who uh, have backgrounds in intelligence work. They're, they're, they're incredible believers, but they, they do this technical work. We have facial recognition technology as part of it. You know, our stuff, our stuff that was given to us by youth around the country is so cool that Las Vegas Metro Police Department asks for us every weekend. Every weekend, we're out with them because they prefer our stuff to theirs. <laughs> I'll take it right? We use those things like crazy. Well, they came back, Speed the Light did this last year and said, we want you to be our main project again. And so this time uh, for their 75th anniversary, um, uh, kids have raised $780,000. We're getting eight more units, mobile medical units, all these things so that we can take what is needed and put it in the middle of the need, right? What we find is there's a lot of services available, and in rural America, there really isn't. It gets a little hard because there's not a lot of capacity uh, for, you know, for abuse centers, you know, safe houses, things like that. In cities like Las Vegas, where we base, there is, but just because something's available doesn't mean it's accessible. Uh, same with the gospel. Just because the 
the gospel is available doesn't mean people understand that it's needed in their life. So we have to take what we know and bring it to them, right? They're not usually going to find their way to a church or to something, but if we're in the middle of that need, we see them accessing that help all the time. So not only did they raise $780,000, but, um, but they actually, it's caught on, so it's like $1.2 million worth of new equipment we're going to get. We're going to be in seven different states consistently being able to be present in people's time of need. Florida, and the Carolinas, and the Gulf of Mexico, and Texas, and Nevada, and Minnesota, you know, and Milwaukee, all these areas we have points of contact for churches to be involved and help each and every day. We're very excited about that. The problem was, and this is where it needs your prayer, and this is where I'll tell you your offering's going today, is we just spent the last eight months not being able to get all that lined up, right? The money's there for the equipment, but we don't have, uh, we haven't had the ability to raise the funds needed to make sure the license and registration and, and uh, just the nuts and bolts stuff of, of this whole thing can be taken care of. So your, your prayer is needed for that. By the end of this year, we're trying to raise $20,000. That'll take care of that until they finally let uh, us all gather and COVID and all that stuff gets out of the way. And then you know, because churches and people want to help. We just haven't had access to be able to present that need yet. And so that's what we're trying to do. We had eight months of no traveling. God took care of our daily bread needs. Let's say it that way. God's been there, daily bread for us this whole way, including all our missionaries. We have almost 20 missionaries on our team. All of them are self-funded. So Free International actually does just tremendous work on almost no budget because we don't have to pay people's salaries, right? They're all self-contained, which is really cool. Um, in fact, I had one of the attorneys general pulled our tax forms and stuff and looked at it and, and he knew how we did what we did. He goes, there's no way you're doing everything you're doing on that amount of money. And he didn't say that as you're a liar. He's just like, he understood how we did it. He just couldn't, it just blew him away. And I go, well, the capacity building is in the church, right? You can't hire enough missionaries. You can't hire enough people to do the work that's needed. The trafficking is the second largest criminal enterprise in the world right now, only behind drugs. And it's growing at a faster rate because drugs is like coffee. You, you consume it once, you got to you know, go through the whole process again. But these girls we work with, you know, 10, 15, 20 times a night, seven days a week are being exploited. That's reusable, right? Well, we're going to stop that. Amen. But the reality of it all is it, it's growing because of that reason. But the cool part is the church is everywhere. I can't hit that enough, right? We have rural girls in Nevada getting worked every night. Internet is an awesome thing, but if we have access to the world, the world has access to us. So as parents, love on your kids. You know what the number one risk factor is for those being, uh, end up being trafficked is? Not everybody who has this risk ends up traffic, not even close. But the number one risk factor, it's not socioeconomic, it's not race, it's self-esteem. And self-esteem is built into your daughter's dads by how you love on your daughters and how you love on your wife or you know, the baby mom or whatever the setup is. You, you build value into your family by being present with your family. Be present. Be very present. The church is the best place for people to end up because that is, uh, we have to show the world what real community, real family looks like. That happens here. And then it's, it's done out in the world. You don't want your daughter walking in on you while you're surfing porn. <laughs> you know, in fact, you know, uh, porn, most of the girls I've worked with have been forced or coerced to do porn too. So you never know if what you're looking at isn't somebody that I'm trying to get out of their situation, right? Um, it is not a victimless crime, a uh, victimless situation, right? And I don't say that to heap coals on anyone's head. What I'm saying is we need to draw back from ourselves, right? If God called us out of darkness into light, then we shouldn't have one foot in the darkness while nobody's looking and, and one foot in the light while we're here. 
a healthy family, father, mother, family, kids, comes as we're willing to lay our lives down in service. First, first to your wife and your kids, your husband, your kids, your grandkids, and then to this church, and then to this community, and then to the world. There's no doubt in my mind that a church in the middle of rural North Dakota can impact the world as we serve those closest to us. I've seen it. I'm a product of it. God called us out of darkness so that we might be light. And I thank you guys for listening to me ramble today. I usually have a line of attack. I did not today. And I didn't even have to, I didn't have the excuse of a potluck going on to, you know, <laughs> that distracted me. But thanks for listening to me ramble. But I really thank you guys and, and value your prayers, right? We're, we're, we need it. Um, every Friday for the next month and Saturday, we're going to be working uh, all night on the right off the Las Vegas Strip with girls there. Our team in the Gulf of Mexico is working almost every weekend uh, and throughout the week. Uh, missing, uh, missing kids, uh, now that things are opening up, are just skyrocketing. Excuse me. Vulnerability is happening. A lot of these girls that we had already started helping, now some of the strip clubs and other things are starting to open, and the, the temptation is to go back in because that's what they know. Pray for them. Uh, got family members that are struggling because they know their daughter is being exploited, but they just can't get to them. Pray for us that we can get to them, that we can get through to them. Not just get to them, but get through to them. Only God can drop that veil off. And generations of exploitation have it just wiped away in the blink of an eye. That's what I'm praying for. What I'm doing is digging in in case that never happens. We are never going to be the reason that these girls feel they have to go back to their situations. But always a light post of hope, just like the church. One of our guys said, hey, when I got involved with Free International, I began to realize how one was a very big number. We believe that, right? Jesus left the 99 to go find the one, right? One is a very big number. All of heaven rejoices when one comes to know him. And that's why we do our tagline. I'm going to leave you with this. We're going to keep working with churches just like yours serving areas like North Dakota and beyond until everyone is free. God bless you guys.